This is the DS7 and it's a little bit like the Pompidou Centre in Paris because it's very French and it's designed to be quirky. Now in this video I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about this car including some updates that DS have made to it including the removal of the name Crossback from the car's title. Anyhow, I'm going to talk you around the exterior of the interior. I'm going to show you how practical it is, try its technology. I'm going to take it for a drive. I'm going to launch it, see how quick it is from 0 to 60 miles an hour because I'm Matt Watson and you're watching Car Wow! Let's do it! Buy, sell, car wow! Right, let's talk around the design changes that DS have made to the DS7. So, they've given it some new tail lights, which look a little bit more jingle jangle jewellery like. Also, they've written DS across the back in 3D letters. Things that haven't changed though are the big stupid reflectors and the um, fake exhaust surrounds. If you look in there, you'll see the actual exhaust pipe. Still overall, I think it's quite a nice looking car from the back, same from the side. I like it in profile too. Now, alloy wheels start at 19 inches, rising to 21s. These are the 20s and they fill the arches quite nicely. You also have like black cladding right here and running down the side to make it look off-roadery and the roof bars which you don't get on the inch level car but you have on all of the versions do add to that suv look now the color of the roof bars change depending on the trim level you go for as does the surround for the windows quite like it in this chrome and silver speaking of which if you have the chrome and silver roof bars then you get chrome elements here in the grill otherwise they're black and the grill itself has been changed compared to when this car was called the DS7 Crossback. They've made it bigger, because bigger is better and newer, obviously. Sort of like the huge mouth on a basking shark. And these would be the basking shark's gills. What they've actually done here is you have your LED daytime running light strip here, but these parts are actually transparent, so the light emits through there as well. It's actually quite a nice effect. They've also changed the headlights on the car, so they're now sleeker, and you get matrix LED lights as standard, so they'll blank out part of their beam when you're driving along so you don't dazzle oncoming drivers. Quite like this car from the front. It's fairly good looking really, isn't it? But it should be when you consider the price. So it starts from around £37,000, rising to over £60,000 for the top of the range version. Now, if you're thinking about buying this car or any car, you want to make sure you're paying a fair price for it and you can do that through CarWow. To do that, just click on the pop-out banner up there or follow the link in the description below. You can also sell your current car through CarWow as well. You just upload some photos, give a brief description, then dealers all across the country will bid on your car. You just pick the highest offer. They'll come to your house, take your car away, and put the money straight into your account. So now you can not only buy your next car through CarWow, you can sell your current car as well. Now, if you want to do that at a later date, you just simply Google help me car wow and we will help you change your car the interior design isn't quite as successful as the exterior design in some ways it's just a little bit fussy they've tried to make it unique and it is unique but not necessarily always in a good way there's lots going on with diamonds about the place like diamonds here diamonds here diamonds here diamond shapes here diamonds diamonds are forever sorry about that I do like these bits though these switches here that they, they kind of look cool but then they go and have this strange knobby thing it's it's a little bit phallic i don't think we need a drive selector gear selector thingy whatever you want to call it in this sort of shape anymore you just need some simple buttons now one of the big changes they did to this car compared to the previous version is it used to be able to get smaller screens so now you just get this big screen but i'm not sure about the bezel shape it just looks a bit cheap and naff and like a child's toy which is a shame because the screen is nice and big and it's very customizable so you can choose what is your home screen and various different icons and things like that which is a good thing about it what's not so good about it though is the fact that if you want to operate the climate control, you have to do it through the screen. You can bring up the menu that way or turn it off by pressing this shortcut button, but to actually set the temperature, then you have to then do it like this, the screen and the fan as well. It's one button press too many. You just want to be able to turn a knob. All models now get the full digital driver display rather than smaller screens like you had when it was the DS7 crossback. And there's various different views you can look at, but I don't like the design of them. They just seem unnecessarily quirky. In terms of the driving position itself, in some ways you sit quite low, a bit too low for an SUV, but you can jack the seat at quite a long way so you get a better view out, so you're sitting up higher. It's a little bit too high. Let's go back down again. And that brings me on to the view at the back window. It's quite a narrow back window, yet you have quite a large rear view mirror. They could make the mirror quite a bit smaller because you only really need to see at the back window in the mirror, don't you? You don't need the rest of it. I suppose you can be checking on your kids. Yeah, they should have made that smaller. Anyhow, interior quality. Mm. 
It's pretty nice. The entry level car actually has Alcantara on the dash, and that doesn't work as well in this car. Alcantara is for sporty, racy cars, not something like this. Leather, much better. And generally, quality is pretty good. And look, the center console is nice and solid. There's no wobble in it. But as you feel a bit lower down, things do start to feel a bit cheap. Speaking of which, I feel a bit cheap right now because while I have some switches there for various functions, there's one which seems to be like a timer for preheating the cabin. Yet when I press it, it doesn't move. Is it because this particular car doesn't have this feature? What's all that about, eh? Anyway, let's move on to practicality. So, decent under central cubby storage, a couple of cup holders there, which aren't big enough. Oh, a lie. Oh, just about big enough <laughs> for two bottles. You've got some more storage here, and there's a the USBs there. So they're USB-Cs in an old-fashioned 12-volt socket. Just shut that. And huge door bins, absolutely huge. And they're lined with felt, so things don't rattle about in them. Look, massive. All quite practical here in the front. Let's check out the back seats there. So, knee room back here is fairly decent. You can slide your feet a little bit under the seat in front. It's also good that you've got a completely flat floor. That means that when you carry three people in the back at once, the person who gets the middle seat does have enough room to put their feet there. There's plenty of space for everyone's feet really. However, it's not the best of carrying three people in the back at once because the body is quite narrow. As a result, the people in the outer seats end up like rubbing their heads against this roof here, which isn't ideal. In fact, a Volvo XC40 has a bit more interior space. If you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, click on the pop-out banner up there, I'll follow the link in the description below. Another thing worth noting is the fact that these seat bases, they're really nice and deep, which is good. And I love the contouring of the seats. It feels very expensive. However, you don't have very deep footwells. As a result, you don't get so much under thigh support as you otherwise would have unless you sit slightly at a jaunty angle. Are you jaunty? I'm jaunty. You've got to be careful if you go jaunty though, because the way this little console produces the bit with the tri-zone climate control and a couple of USBs, you can sometimes like end up bashing in there on it, especially if you're like moving about a bit or like going across the car to get out through one of the other doors. I did that earlier, that's why I'm raising it right now, and my knee does still hurt. Speaking of hurt, if you're over six foot, you might find that headroom isn't the best. It doesn't help when you've got the panoramic glass roof because that does it into head space, but there is a solution. Certain models come with back seats that recline electrically, and doing that does give you a bit more headroom. But what about when it comes to fitting a child seat? Well, one issue is that the rear doors don't open that wide, so you do find a bit of a struggle getting a bulky seat in. However, while the isofix angle points are a little bit hidden, they're actually very easy to get to, so it's quite simple to just locate the seat and lock it into place. And there is enough room back here to actually rotate a big bulky rear-facing seat round without having to push the front passenger seat forward, which is good. In terms of the features, like we have an armrest here with exposed cup holders and they're really not very deep, so your drink's probably not gonna stay in there. You have some pockets on the seat backs which are quite shallow. Can't fault the door bins though. Let me just get my bottle. They are a decent size, and like in the front, also lined with felt. Anyway, that's enough about practicality here in the back seats. So let's see how practical this car is when it comes to carrying luggage. The boot capacity is 555 litres, which is slightly bigger than an Audi Q3, a little bit bigger still than a BMW X1, and a little bit bigger again than a Volvo XC40. It's a bit of a shame, though, that you do have a bit of a load lip to lift stuff over. Uh, oh, especially if it's heavy like that. Oh, bugger. But there are some nice features in this boot. So, look, you have a 12 volt socket there. You also have some tie down points. And underneath here is just a little bit of extra storage where you can keep your towing eye and stuff like that. Lovely, jubbly. Also, I like the fact that you have releases for the back seats here as well as on the top of the seat backs. Look. Wah, cha chong, la, wee. Ah, uh, bit of a shame about this thing though, look. If you want to slide heavy things to the front. Oh, oh God, I'm going to do my back in doing this. This ridge is very uh, annoying. What's even more annoying is that when this car was the DS7 Crossback, you used to be able to get this false floor, which would mean that you had a flat floor, so you could slide things in dead easy. And while the ridges to hold it are still there, the actual item itself is not. Even the things that are designed to hold the false floor up when you're like putting stuff underneath it are still there. I mean, that's just lazy. Why, why have they 
deleted that item. What's what? What is that all about? It's just stupid. That actually brings you on to five annoying things about the DS7 not crossback. Look at this, the glove box. It's tiny because you have the fuse box there. Normally what some manufacturers do is when they move the steering wheel across for right-hand drive cars, they also move the fuse box so that you have a full-size glove box. Not here, not with the DS7. Thank you. If you need to be able to tow this, is probably not the car for you. You see, the normal diesel can only tow 1.4 tonnes. The hybrid is just 1.2 tonnes. Now, by comparison, a Lexus NX can tow 1.5 tonnes, a Mercedes GLA, an Audi Q3 and BMW X1 can tow 1.8 tonnes, and a Volvo XC40 can tow 2.1 tonnes. Oh dear. I can't believe some manufacturers still allow this to happen. Look, when you fold down the seats, seat belts do that and you push that back and they're snagged and it's all a bit of a faff and that's not any problem back here because look 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 the rear windows that's as far down as they go that's it the gear shifter pedals are useless reason being is that ds have mounted them to the steering column which isn't a problem if the paddles are large so that when you turn a wheel you can still operate the paddle or you can have them small but attached to the wheel because then the paddle is exactly where your hands are in this car no you turn like that and you go for a gear and you can't find it the icons for the shortcut buttons are illuminated but if you don't have the ignition on you can still use the infotainment system but for some reason the icons for the shortcut buttons go out yet they still work as buttons you just don't know what it is exactly you're pressing why? However, it's not all bad. Here's five cool things about the DS7. This car gets adapted suspension as standard. Plus, it has a feature where it uses a camera to read the road ahead, and if it sees bumps, it'll slacken off the suspension to take the sting out of them. As well as your normal driving mode, which is sport and all that kind of stuff, there's a four-wheel drive mode. Now, the car has selectable four-wheel drive, so if it feels that you need some extra traction at the back, then it will make that rear motor provide some power to the rear axle. However, with the four-wheel drive mode, it always has power on the rear axle, so that's probably handy if you're going off-road. Speaking of which, if you do go off-road into some mud, the good news is that, look, the doors they cover the sills so that when you do get out, if the doors and bodywork are covered in grime, you don't end up transferring that grime to the back of your trousers as you brush your legs over this sill while exiting. Good news, that. DS is part of the Stellantis group, which also includes Peugeot. However, you can tell that DS is posher than Peugeot just by opening their bonnets and comparing the two cars. For instance, to hold up the bonnet with a Peugeot, you have to use this sticky digi dibbly diggery dewy thingy it's the official name of it whereas on the ds oh no none of that oh pure luxury we have gas struts oh oh satisfying you get a heated front windscreen which can defrost in winter quicker than just using the normal heater plus you have the washer nozzles for the windscreen in the actual windscreen wiper so when you apply it to clean the windscreen and you're driving along you don't get suddenly blinded because it's not spraying up then wiping away it's spraying and wiping simultaneously all models get acoustic glass as standard on the front windows and even the back windows and it's basically like double glazing for cars it helps improve sound insulation so you get less noise from outside entering the cabin and this actually brings me on to the spec and trim levels right across the range let's see what you get as standard as you move throughout the different models. The range kicks off with the performance line and you get keyless entry and go, ambient lighting, and you can choose between these different colors. Plus there's wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Next up is the performance line plus, which gets electrically operated front seats. They're also heated and you get a reversing camera. Then there's the Rivali, which has the pop-up clock. That's clock, by the way. And it also gets massard seats, which has funny names for the massard. Well, this is called Cat. Or it doesn't feel much like a massage though, it does actually feel like a cat just gently touching you. It's so weak, the massage. Moving on, the Rivali also gets adaptive cruise control, so it'll automatically keep you safe distance from the car in front and still to keep you alive, which is good. The next trim level up is called the Esprit de Voyage, which means the spirit of the journey. <laughs> what a stupid name for a trim level. Anyway, it includes an electronic tailgate with, look, hands-free access. Oh yeah. 
Also, with it, it's pretty voyage, darling, you get ventilation for the front seats and this nice light grey interior. The silly trim level names continue with this car, which is the Opera. It has a panoramic glass sunroof, which opens and closes. A special button there that you can press to get access to a help centre. And you can say, help, I accidentally just shut myself in the sunroof. And you also get a wireless charging pad for your mobile phone. At the top of the range is La Première, and it has an upgraded focal stereo. You get 360 degree cameras, so cameras all around the cars, so you get a bird's eye view, plus it has night vision. Of course it does. So that's all the trims dealt with. What about the engine choices? The range kicks off with a 1.5 litre diesel with 130 horsepower. It drives the front wheels by an eight-speed automatic gearbox. In fact, all models get an eight-speed automatic gearbox. Then we have the plug-in hybrids. They all use a 1.6-litre turbocharged petrol engine, which drives the front wheels mated to an electric motor. In the 225 horsepower version, that's your lot. It drives the front wheels. Then there's the four-wheel drive versions, which add an electric motor to the rear axle. Then you can get two versions of that car, a 300 horsepower version or a 360 horsepower version. Are you confused? You're wondering which engine and trim level to choose. Well, don't worry, I'm gonna help you out here. I'm gonna configure my ideal DS7 using the CarWire configurator. And if you wanna see what the trim level and engine choice I've gone for and the saving you can get through CarWire, you're gonna to have to click on the pop-out banner up there or follow the link in the description below to go find out what it is. Now though, let's find out what this car is like to drive. I'm going to start off by seeing what the DS7 is like to drive in town. So I've got it set up in electric only mode and it will do over 40 miles under electric power load according to DS and it can do over 80 miles an hour in electric only mode. Good thing about electric only mode is that it's silent, you can see, silent, effortless and nippy enough around town really does just help with the driving experience. Also, one of the things I find sometimes with hybrid cars, the brakes can be a little bit grabby because the first part of braking is regen for the batteries. And then the second part, it's the friction brakes. You know, we need to slow down really quickly. And sometimes manufacturers can struggle to blend the two together, but this, this does a good job of it. As for the suspension over bumps, it's a bit of a strange one, this. Certain bumps, like if I find some certain bumps, like this ahead now, it's good at. You can tell that camera system's working, it's just reading the road, and it's just slackening the suspension as you go over the bumps. However, sometimes it gets caught out, and I might have got caught out here because I want to test the turning circle. So it's 11.8 meters, which is pretty decent. You know, it's similar to its competitors. But is it enough to get around here? Indeed it is. And it was made easy by the fact that the steering is nice and light. You now, if the turning circle wasn't quite so good, I would have caused chaos there, but I haven't. I don't feel that I have. Everything is fine. Anyway, back to the suspension. You see, while it is good at times, other times you can tell that it hasn't quite read the road properly and it'd be like a more hidden bump and then you get a bit of a thwack. Right, here's, here's an example. Oh, cheeky pothole. Seemed to have spotted that, that time. Right, see if we can get another one here. That's a bit cheekier, there. So that was a bit more hidden and then you felt a bit more. Another thing about the suspension is that when I drove the diesel version of this, the previous generation, it was all very soft and relaxing over all surfaces. This one, it feels a bit firmer. Now, part of the reason for that is because it's the plug-in hybrid and because you've got the addition of electric motors and batteries, this car's heavier, about 300 kilograms heavier than the diesel. So this weighs in at 1.8 tonnes, diesel's like 1.5 tonnes. And that's a big difference. You see, if your car's heavier, you have to fit it with stiffer suspension and that is what's happened here. See, when you're driving along, while the car can deal well with like obvious bumps and bigger bumps, like the small imperfections in the road, it doesn't deal with so well. And as a result, it just seems to fidget a bit. Whereas the diesel DS7 I drove a few years ago, that just seemed all nice and squidgy over all surfaces and perfectly relaxing. Bit of a shame that. One of the things I like about this car is that it does hold you in electric only mode, so you can accelerate hard and it will keep it in electric, won't suddenly bring the engine in, unless you push the accelerator so far that you activate a switch and then it basically brings in the petrol motor. And here's an example. So I want to accelerate now to overtake this car in front and I floor it. And off we go, the petrol motor kicks in and now we're flying. And it's, it's pretty quick, this is actually. You notice that when you put your foot down, there's the initial part of the acceleration is done with electric power and then you feel more of a surge as the petrol motor then takes over. It does mean it's responsive though, the fact that you've got that filling while the petrol motor and the gearbox decide what to do. It's not the smoothest, but it does just help with your progress. Speaking of progress, when you're cruising along, there's a little bit of wind noise, 
I'm noticing road noise a little bit more than in some competitors from Audi or Mercedes. Speaking of which, if you want to see my full in-depth video review of the Mercedes GLA, click on the pop-out banner up there, I'll follow the link in the description below. And that brings me on to the fuel efficiency. So this plug-in hybrid is supposed to do 250 miles to the gallon. No. Over 300 so miles of use, this car has averaged 33. Now imagine part of the reason for that is that the people who've been using it have been journalists like me, they haven't had the ability to plug in the car and use it as it's supposed to be used. As a result, it's just been running on its petrol engine most of the time as a normal hybrid. But still, I think if you're doing regular long distances, you're better off with the diesel. I will tell you one slight advantage of the hybrid over the diesel that I drove a few years ago. And that car seemed to lean quite a lot in the bends. This one though, seems to stay a lot flatter. That could be a trade-off of it having that stiffer suspension. I've got it in sports mode and that has stiffened up the suspension. It's improved the throttle response. You don't think of this as being a quick car, but it has actually got 300 horsepower. So it goes all right. Is it the kind of car that you want to thrash down a back route? Well, it's a little bit of an odd one because while it does stay pretty flat in the bends, what happens is, the, while it doesn't lean much, the front tires seem to just run out of grip and they push on. So you're going into a corner, you think, oh, this is nice and flat like a sports car. And you turn the wheel for it to go around a corner and it's just going wider than you imagined. That's a bit of a problem. Also, there's literally no point of using the paddle shifters for the gearbox. Like I said earlier, you can't really operate them when you're turning the wheel because you can't find them. What I can't fault though, is the acceleration out of a bend. Because you've got a little bit of help from an electric motor on the rear axle, you do get pushed out of the turns. But then once again, if you get too carried away, you start running wide. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna launch this car to see how quick it is from 0 to 60 miles an hour. First of all, an electric only motor, so here we go. That actually picked up pretty well. What's it gonna do? 11.28. I think that is pretty good for electric only mode and it gives you an idea of just how punchy it feels on electric only mode. It's not hot hatch quick, but it's okay family car kind of speed. Okay, let's do it again, but this time with the petrol engine working too. Let's see what happens now. I'm in sports mode, engine running, going to hold it on the brake. <laughs> not to 30 is a second quicker. 0-60, 5.63. That is actually really quite quick. DS claimed 5.9 seconds, but that's better than claimed. You forget, actually, that, you know, this car's got 300 horsepower. That's as much as a Volkswagen T-Roc R. Now, if you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, click on the pop-out banner up there. I'll put the link in the description below. So then, what's my final verdict on the DS7? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should consider it. It's a pretty good car. It's just that there's quite a few alternatives which are a little bit better. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like. Also, let me know if you agree with my verdict by voting in the pinned comment below. If you want to see some videos on alternatives to this car, click on those windows there. And if you want to see how much money you can save on your next car, click on that box there to get a car wow.